Grebenwolf. Frankelford. You're both right. Hello there, everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire, going on with our first edition Pathfinder Investigator Guide. Today, we are going to be taking a look at some of their level four extracts, and these are extracts that you are going to want to make use of pretty regularly. They should be, give you a pretty solid template of things to look for, and we'll talk about a couple to avoid as well. But before we get into all of that, if you're new here to the channel, then go on down there hit the subscribe button and become a regular member here at the gamers den or if you've already gone on ahead and listed yourself on such an incredible roster of legendary heroes then go on down to hit the like button and share the video far and wide now we will go ahead and start going into your level four extracts and to kick things off we have freedom of movement this one you are going to want to make use of because you only have that two-thirds base attack bonus progression which it's not bad but when it comes to combat maneuvers and dealing with a high strength opponent with a full uh, attack bonus progression if they grapple hold of you that's going to be incredibly difficult and what this will let you do is you can touch target creature and for 10 minutes per level they may move and attack normally even while under effects that impede movement such as webs grappling or the entangle spell things like that so absolutely invaluable for you or possibly any other party members if you've picked up the infusion investigator talent next we have greater false life cast on yourself and for one hour per level you gain 2d10 plus one uh, per caster level in hit points, maxing out at a plus 20. Now, that doesn't seem like a whole lot, and you figure that uh, by the time you get this, you're, what, level 10, and then 2d10, you're averaging about 10 to 11 hit points, so an extra 21 hit points or so? That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you've got a d8 for hit points, you're relying on dex and light armor to really boost your armor class, as well as, say, the shield spell to get another bit of a deflection bonus added into there. Having even an extra 20 hit points will be very valuable for you. That'll go really far and compare nicely with feats like the uh, Toughness feat, which will give you extra hit points as you level in advance. So there are some guides that say that this isn't really all that great for the investigator. I'm inclined to disagree just because having that little bit of extra mileage, even though these are uh, hit points that are going to be temporary overall, still having them in place can mean the difference between dying and be being up and still kicking. Next, we have Stone Skin. This will cost you 250 gold pieces in diamond dust and granite. Touch target creature gains damage reduction 10 up uh, versus adamantine up to 150 damage total that can be blocked so every single attack that comes your way you subtract 10 hit points of damage off of it up until you get to that 150 damage total so that'll go quite a long ways not through several fights depending on how big the fights are but at least a couple of encounters and again will do a lot to make sure that you're staying alive and by the time you get this again level 10 250 gold pieces of diamond dust and granite, that's going to be relatively inexpensive for you at that point. So this can be worth it to break out for those big fights, particularly fights against that uh, particular arc's big bad. Speaking of, you also want to keep an eye on spells like the Restoration spell. Touch target creature to remove temporary negative levels for 100 gold pieces of diamond dust or one permanent negative level for 1,000 gold pieces worth of diamond dust. You can only remove one permanent negative level in a week using this spell. So it does limit its effectiveness, but it also kind of limits how expensive it is, and it gives you a means of removing those permanent levels, as well as the the temporary negative levels. Those permanent negative levels are the bane of so many adventuring parties. Removing them is an absolute must to make sure that you and your allies are operating at peak efficiency. Then after that though, we have the echolocation spell. You cast on yourself and for 10 minutes per level, you have blind sense out to 40 feet. Using sounds only detectable by dragons or other creatures using echolocation, such as bats or several different kinds of uh, marine mammals as an example. So 
This does a lot to negate defenses like, say, if somebody were to drop down a darkness spell on you, or even deeper darkness, because your precision damage relies on you being able to discern your target's location, be able to see their weak, uh, their weak points and the like, and Blind Sense helps you to do that, helps you to pinpoint your opponents and be able to strike them much more accurately. So definitely a great spell to have. Also, it's just Blind Sense. Blind Sense is awesome to have. Next, we have Arcane Eye. Create a magic eye that lasts one minute per level with unlimited range and sees exactly as you see. So if you have dark vision or low light vision, or if you're working with some effect of true seeing and the like, it will be able to see as you're able to see with those effects. It travels 30 feet per round if you're just looking at the floor, or 10 feet per round if you're looking at the floor and ceiling. So you can absorb a lot of details, get a good idea of what the layout is ahead of you, and given that perception's a class skill, and you are likely maxing that out and have means of boosting that to incredible levels, you're probably going to be able to pick out a lot of threats, a lot of angles where you could be attacked or ambushed, traps to disarm, any magical effects that might be in place. You're going to be able to learn a lot of that information and make you and your party more capable of surviving what may be coming your way. And next we have Enchantment Foil. Cast on yourself and it lasts for one hour per level, you gain a plus four untyped bonus versus enchantment spells and effects. If you succeed on a will save, you identify the spell as if you'd made a spellcraft check. You can also act as though you failed your save, getting a plus 20 untyped bonus on bluff to do so. Attempts to use magic to detect this ploy or force you to speak the truth must make a caster level check DC 15 plus your caster level. So you're looking at about a, di a difficulty of 25 that you're imposing on opponents. Uh, enemy casters of equivalent level or lower, they're not likely to succeed that, though again a level 10 caster, they only need to roll a 15 or better to get it. It's a 1 in 4 chance, not the greatest odds in your favor, but certainly you've had far worse. Higher level casters, of course, will be able to get around this a fair bit easier, but even if they're level, let's say, level 20, you know, you're, they're still sitting at about, what, 20? Well, actually, DC 15 plus your caster level, level 15, so it's both DC 25, 1D 20 plus the 20, so yeah, they, they stand decent odds of getting around that. Uh, my inability to do math on the fly without pen and paper notwithstanding, it's not bad, but higher level casters are definitely much more likely to get around it. This is going to be useful for roughly equivalent opponents or lower, who still may be trying to use magic on you or your allies. And with this in place and the fact that you have good will saving throws, you're more likely to be able to succeed at this and with its insane duration of an hour per level you're looking at t uh, 10 hours of having this plus four untyped bonus versus enchantment spells and effects and well succeeding on will saves is probably the most important out of the three and being able to pull one over on opponents can allow you to gain access to areas that would otherwise be closed off or require significant conflict to get into so this spell can be incredibly useful though it's not going to be broadly applicable across multiple campaigns. Especially if you're in a situation where it's just direct combat already, you're supposed to fall uh, to this spell and you are immediately directed, say, to uh, attack your allies. Well, they're being able to pull that one off in a convincing manner where you're not just outright murdering your allies is going to be a little bit tricky, so maybe not necessarily useful there. But in my favorite style of campaigns with cloak and dagger kind of style campaigns where you're doing clandestine espionage kind of things, this will work really, really well. But even aside from all of that, again, a plus four untyped bonus versus enchantment spells and effects, that's pretty damn worth it as it is. Now, as examples of some spells to avoid, the uh, first one that comes to mind is tongues, particularly communal tongues. The tongue spell in and of itself can be really useful. Um, you can 
uh, basically have to uh, have the ability to communicate with anyone or anything capable of speech or language and be able to understand them, have them understand you. It's great for information gathering. But communal tongues, not necessarily all that important because there only needs to be really one person that's capable of uh, socially engaging other other characters, uh, so it's not really going to be the most necessary thing. If you suspect it might be, then having it as a scroll might might work out just fine, especially since you have access to, uh, to use magic device. And any other spells that come up, let me think, anything that deals fire damages, especially at this level, is going to be worth skipping over. Spells like Caustic Blood I've seen some guides recommend that you put it on yourself, and given that you are meant to get into melee with how this class's abilities are set up, that certainly is an option, but it seems like it would be better suited to go on to a fighter, a barbarian, or paladin. Uh, somebody like that. That seems like a more ideal position because they're going to be in the thick of the fighting on subtly. Sure, they might be maneuvering, but they don't have the movement abilities that you have. They don't have the ability to blink around, do quick little jaunts through their combinations of feats and talents and uh, the different extracts that you're able to make use of. So you have other options. Making Caustic Blood, it's not a bad choice, but not a choice you'd be using for yourself. And really, there, like I said last episode, there are so many more extracts out there. This is just a taste meant to get you started. Definitely play around with it, and don't necessarily take my word as something set in stone. This is just a build I'm playing around with to gain a better understanding of the class, to help you gain a better understanding of the class. And this is mostly a purely mechanical look at this class. So if you have a particular spell that catches your eye, but mechanically maybe it's not the most effective, but you just really like it and seems like something your character would use, use it. Absolutely use it. These guides are just that. Guides. But with all that said, what do you think? Go on down to the comments below and let me know your thoughts. Did you like today's video? Did you dislike it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Hit the like or dislike buttons. And remember, if you've made it this far, you must have enjoyed something. So why not go ahead and hit the subscribe button and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. But with all that said, I've been your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Thank you all so very much for your time. Good gaming to you all, and you all have yourselves a good night.